Hello again, thank you for staying for the Q&A after the movie Aramen. This is my fellow critic and colleague Antonin Tessas. And of course, I uh, very welcome our special guest after the screening, the screenwriter and director Christian Munju. Hello. Hello. Thank you for staying with us. Maybe FM will show you the, the full house of pop of this evening. Czech and Romanian audience also. Thank you so much. Thank you, of course. Of course, there will be questions uh, from audience. There is a lot of space for you. Maybe for stars, I, I, I begin with uh, a little bit general question. Um, for me, one of the main topics of, of all of your movies uh, always been the human nature, maybe, maybe the injustice or cruelty um, that so-called normal people are capable of. Uh, would you maybe agree and tell us more about this this uh, topic in our in our movies in general? Um, well, it's true that finally all my films speak about human nature, but also this is very general if you think about this. I'm always actually trying to find a story which speaks about, if you want, the the state of the world in that moment, about something relevant, relevant for me and relevant for uh, the way we are as humanity in that moment. I spent a lot of time preparing my films. I can't make uh, films very, very often. So somehow I need to believe that the things I'm talking about are somehow important. And this is why I end up by um, having this uh, human nature as a topic, if you want. Uh, but uh, in a way in which I try to understand always why people behave in a certain way in a given situation. And beyond the first level, I try to understand a little bit more profoundly. And when I stumbled across this story, because I always start from something that really happened somewhere, I, I had the feeling that it speaks a lot about uh, very many things that preoccupy me and I think preoccupy a lot of us today. It speaks about a certain kind of anxiety about the near future. And it speaks about uh, not knowing precisely what to teach our children about how the future is going to look. It speaks about our... Um, a uh, trait of character of applying different uh, ways of reacting to similar situations. Um, so I thought it's somehow relevant for what happens today, because first of all, it speaks about this, this difference between uh, our own personal truth, the things that we believe deep down when we are at home and we talk to somebody else and we think that we are uh, deep down in our intimacy and what we say in, in, in public. I think that there's a gap in between and I think that any kind of uh, social improvement can start only after you are curious enough to understand what people really believe. And sometimes I think that, uh, you know, um, things evolve historically into their own rhythm, but on a human level, sometimes uh, some things happen somehow faster than people can really assimilate them. And one of them is this globalization with a lot of changes and a lot of changes connecting connected to something that I called, if you want, a new form of migration. Of course, people always migrated, but question is when somebody else that you don't know comes over to your territory, why is your first impulse to consider him rather an enemy than a human being which is similar to you? 
Because unfortunately, this is the first reflex to consider that somebody else is always guilty for something happening to you and not necessarily you. And first of all, to consider that he's an enemy. And part of it, of course, uh, has, uh, if you want, uh, historical, psychological explanations. But some other part is contextual and depends on each other's situation in particular. Uh, you described uh, very general themes and topics uh, that your movie is based on, but uh, was there some specific uh, concrete event that happened in Romania or somewhere somewhere else that uh, inspire, inspired uh, the movie, that inspired the, the plot? Yes, as I said, I'm, I'm always um, trying to, to start from a real incident. I continue reading a lot of press. Um, when I was in my 20s, I used to work for a while for, for as a journalist. So, And I'm really fascinated by a lot of things that I read in the press. So I read these articles, I keep them, I store them in folders. And every now and then there is one which uh, has the potential to become a little bit more relevant for me. And it was the case with this one. Um, the story in reality happened in Romania um, two years ago, I think. It was right before the pandemic. And it happened in a tiny little village in the Hungarian living part of Romania, which is somewhere in the middle. And it became news, but it became um, a little piece of news and then big news and uh, the government needed to interfere and then it became international news. And uh, what, what made news is that you wouldn't expect for a small community, an ethnical community, uh, who always felt, felt somehow uh, that they need to, to fight for their rights, you wouldn't expect that they would, be, um, would have so little understanding for somebody else and even smaller and fragile community starting to uh, unfold in within their territory. And um, as you can see in the film, there was a, a bakery and they tried to hire some uh, Sri Lankan workers. So this is pretty similar to what you see in the film. Um, of course, then there are a lot of differences and what I do is, you know, starts from there and it develops a lot of other themes. But uh, it happened like this, and um, what I did after I uh, wrote the screenplay, now, you know, um, it's, it's easier now to document something because everything is on the internet. And I think that the only, the only thing these people have not understood is that whatever they said was public. And this uh, uh, reunion of the town that you see in the, in the film exists on the internet. Who speaks uh, Hungarian can Google and find it. And it's very interesting to watch. And uh, these people talk as if they are, they are in their small community over there. But of course, this became news for everybody and everybody could, could watch it. And um, after I wrote the screenplay, I went over there and did a documentation talking to everybody involved in this just to see what the situation was. And after I finished the film, after Cannes this year, I started a tour in Romania showing this film in a lot of places because we do not have uh, too many theaters left. And I started precisely into their community. And I screened the film precisely in this uh, town hall where it all happened because I really wanted to get back to them and to show them their story and to show them that even if everybody considers that they are absolutely guilty, the film uh, does not take sides and it tries to um, detaliate the circumstances in which some people made some decisions. Because even if even in a situation like this, and in all situations in which I start from a, a public incident, I'm always trying not to be judgmental and always trying to understand why somebody decided in a certain way. You told me earlier that you screened the Beyond the Hills yesterday. 
it's, it's the same situation. People always consider very, very easily that somebody is guilty. But this is not what cinema should be concerned. This is not a, a trial. This is not a sociological uh, thesis of any kind. I try to understand why do they react like this. And in this specific situation, you need to understand that if you are part of a very small community who always lived like that, and it was fine. They lived like that for hundreds of years, and it was fine. They do not really understand why all of a sudden things need to change and uh, who decided this change for them. Because they do not have the feeling that all the things that, that, that are changed now are part of their own decision. They experience this as if somebody very far away in this very imprecise concept called the Europe or Brussels decided and all of a sudden they need to change something that they don't want to change. So actually they, they didn't feel very guilty. And um, I noticed something that showing the, the, the film in a lot of, of places so far in, in Romania, everybody watches it from his own perspective. Uh, given what his ideas about uh, xenophobia and about tolerance are, they watch the same film, but they interpret it in very, very different ways. For me, what's important always when I start from a true incident is to see what is the deep relevance of that incident. And for me, this film speaks about a lot of things. It it speaks about... uh, this conflict that exists always between us people, it's enough to have two people in a room and there's a potential conflict. And this conflict is always, uh, you, you don't need too much of a reason for this conflict. Of course, it's easier if the other person is of a different ethnicity or gender or color or religion, this is easier. But you will be surprised to see that people feel conflictual to the other, even if I don't know, they are very similar. Still, there is something deep down. And I would say that it's our animalic nature, if you want. Um, There's always a clash. And this is what the film is somehow trying to talk about. This clash, which is always in between us, between our desire to survive, to fight for survival, to defeat the others and to live on. And our more empathic side, but this empathic side of ours is not as old as our animalic side. It's something that we developed through education, religion, culture, somewhere in the last 5,000 years. So I suspect that this is a very, very thin crust on our brain while this, these deep instincts are really deeply rooted. Thank you, and that always uh, time and space also for your questions for the director, if you have. Any from the audience? Hope maybe we will take your time. And uh, maybe you spoke about the non judgmental approach, about not taking sides. Uh, how difficult it is during the screenwriting process because you are also the screenwriter. Uh, there is some something between film and literature which you are thinking about. Maybe you can ask more about this, the, the, your creative process in, during these uh, hot topics. Um... The most, uh, the most creative part um, of filmmaking for me is when I write, to be honest. It's, it's really more complicated than when I direct. And always because uh, this is when the film takes shape. And I'm always having a lot of objectives when I'm writing. First of all, when I write, I know something that... Uh, I will shoot in uh, plan seconds. I will just shoot very long takes for each other scene. And this influences somehow the way I write. It's uh, a description of what um, the action, how the action is going to be. But that's that's not what's difficult. What is difficult for me is to make sure that um, what I write is uh, very realistic because this is my convention. I, I work in a convention of realism and verosimility, and it's important that whatever happens in the film gives the feeling to all the spectators that if not if this is not the reality, at least it could have been the reality. So this is how I advance. I cannot push 
things in the screenplay that I don't believe are psychologically justified. And then I have a lot of objectives when I write because I'm not uh, starting from characters as some people do. I always start from the action, from the story, from the plot. So I need to make sure that that story generates a certain levels of meanings. And I want as many of these meanings and, and levels of understanding to be understood by the audience. And uh, therefore, my effort is to invent a lot of situations that would serve several purposes at the same time, that would, would make the action and the narration advance, that would be psychologically justified for the desires of each character, but at the same time, that would be relevant for these themes that I want to capture in the film. And after I try all this planning, if you want to be as precise as possible, then I try to make it somehow loose because I understand that as much as uh, the structure of my film is quite precise, um, in film, there's always need for some looseness. And things which are too precise do not correspond to reality because reality is not precise. And then I start rewriting, making sure that I do not have good characters and bad characters, that characters do not speak with what I want to transmit, but with what they sh would say in that specific situation. And I try to make sure that none of them represents too, too much a prototype and it's a human being in flesh and blood with mistakes, with things that you can't put together. So writing, it's a quite complicated process for me, for me in which I try always to uh, connect all these needs that I have so that at the end, the film speaks about these themes that uh, are important for me. And it speaks in a, in a way in which I keep a balance between having them reasonably clear and allowing a degree of abstractness into what I'm saying. Audience, anybody? Yeah? Um, wait for the microphone, please. Um, hi, hi, Christian. Um, Hello. Two small questions. First one, do you consider yourself more as a poet or as a surgeon? Uh, in your movies? As a what? Or as a surgeon? As a poet? Yes, either a surgeon or a poet. Um, hmm. <laughs> Look, um, to be honest, I don't, I don't consider myself in any way, to be very honest. I mean, my life doesn't look at all as, as, you know, as people would imagine. I don't even consider myself to be some, I don't know, what kind of artist or creator. I'm just struggling to tell stories in an honest way as much as I can and uh, in a relevant way, um, trying not to overuse this uh, capacity of filmmaking of being very manipulative. But if I am to choose between these two things, I think that, I don't know, it's uh, 60 percent uh, surgeon and 50 percent poets just to make a joke. <laughs> okay and is there any pain for you personally when making these movies? Is there any pain? Pain. <laughs> pain. Oh yes quite a lot. Thank you for the question. Nobody has asked me this. <laughs> <laughs> yes I mean it's uh, there's uh, it's very difficult to be honest. Uh, it depends how you how easily you 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 take things in life, not only in filmmaking but in life in general, and then in filmmaking. And as you see, I I, I adopted the most complicated way of uh, shooting. Shooting every scene in just one take is the most complicated way of shooting, because uh, it's a way of uh, giving giving up editing voluntarily and I do this simply because it corresponds somehow to my philosophy about film and reality and the relationship between them as much as you know reality is a continuum there is no editing in reality and this is what makes it unbearable 
Then I try to replicate this into the films. And every other moment, I try to capture it in just one perspective so that I respect this time that flows inside. Because, as you know, editing is a very, very personal uh, decision of the filmmaker. Basically, the filmmaker decides that from this scene, only these two portions are useful and the rest I will eliminate. While if you shoot just long takes, it's a responsibility that uh, you pass to the viewer, but together with some trust, he is the one who is going to decide what's important in that shot and what not, and not you as a director. You as a director, you use your skills to be able to set the situation in such a way. But to get back to the pain part of the situation, um, you know, um, the film does not exist before you make it, as you know. So being a filmmaker means making a lot of decisions, always. And these decisions are not you go right or you go left. You are like in a crossroads with a lot of options and you don't know which option is going to take you anywhere. So after you, you know, when you start, when you, you, when you begin at the beginning of your career, it's easier because uh, somehow um, you will surprise people whatever you do. There is no comparison. You haven't made films before. You make a film. Some people will like it. Some people will not. The more you grow old and you make some films, it becomes a bit more complicated, to be honest, because um, uh, all of a sudden you did a lot of things already and you don't want necessarily to make the same film all the time. You need to refresh these things. And uh, refreshing and find, finding... Uh, your innocence that you have at the beginning, it's a very complicated process. So uh, there's a lot of pain for me in writing, first of all, that's the most, and not in writing, to be honest, the most complicated part is deciding what to do next. That's complicated. Once you decided, it's more craft. And then when you shoot, you know, there's something about this film, um, there's a very long scene in the film at some point, and this is the third or fourth film that I do in, in just one, one take per scene. And of course, I developed a sort of skill, if you want. Uh, but at the same time, every morning, I know what I need to do. I make a rehearsal, we start shooting, and I see that things are not there yet, and I don't know why, and I don't know what to do. And this is, uh, this is not an accident. This is the way you advance into this kind of filmmaking. You have to struggle every day to look for this kind of truth and the smoothness that you look in the situation and you rehearse and you repeat and you change. And by the end of the day, somehow there is a process and in most of the days you will get somewhere, but it's a painful process every day. So this is why I, I do not accommodate, uh, I don't know, spectators on my set. There are very many people asking me if they can be there and have a look. It's very stressful. There's nothing much to, to you know, it's not, it's not theater. You can, cannot just stay there and admire the exercise of big... Of course, there are good moments. We had a, a couple of good moments in this film when, you know, things were happening very well, but you never know when these are going to come. Most of it, it's a lot of pain and a lot of hard work. I saw a hand, I believe. Yes. Yeah, Hello. Hello. Uh, I wanted to ask, in North America, a lot of movies that come out are, they don't look at the whole picture. They kind of are ethically more black and white, good and bad, right and wrong maybe, especially the more successful mainstream movies. I wonder how is, how have your movies, which try to look at the whole picture, how have your movies been received in these foreign markets where cinema is more ethically, clearly, quote unquote, divided? Mm -hmm. um, look, to be honest, it's, it's very difficult to have um, a precise answer that would be truthful and that would depict, depict the situation like statistically. What I can tell you is that uh, since four months, three weeks, and two days, I, my films are sold to 
50, 60 territories. So this is something concrete. Uh, when they are released uh, theatrically there, of course, they are not big hits, but there is an audience for them. Uh, then in US, I always had um, a very good press, I would say, and I always had some audience. But of course, um, as long as I make this kind of cinema and in Romanian with subtitles, um, this is what I can I could I can achieve globally, and it's not bad already. I would say when you make a film, it's important to understand for yourself what is success for you. What 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 is successful? How do you how do you know if you manage to to make something or not? And for me, success is not measured in terms of. Uh, how much the film grossed in the box office, and unfortunately, not even of how many people have watched it. Of course, I'd like as many people as possible to watch what I do, but on condition that they can follow what I'm trying to do. For me, it's more important to be honest with my way of filmmaking than to be popular. So I'm always trying to promote my films as much as I can, to talk as much as I can, with as many journalists and as many uh, as many crowds at the end of the film, I'm really interested that the film uh, circulate and I watched. But um, mainstream is mainstream, and mainstream is simpler because it serves a different purpose. It's not better or worse, and I, I I'm not the kind of person that would say that uh, uh, streaming or mainstream are bullshit. No, that's something else. Uh, and uh, what's important in cinema is to make sure that we manage to preserve this diversity of options about how cinema can be used and what for. Because, uh, of course, cinema was entertainment for, from the beginning, but it's not just entertainment. But in order to continue having some audience for more, more complex pictures, as I'm trying to make, um, I think it's important at some point to invest a little bit in a sort of education. I know it sounds awful for, uh, I have kids, so I know uh, whenever you mention education, people do not like it, but um, um, you know, you are not really prepared to watch this kind of cinema if you have watched uh, Pixar and Disney in mainstream by the age of 18. You cannot jump all of a sudden and watch more insightful cinema because the rhythm is very different. And because you assimilate cinema as being so much uh, kind of a feel-good uh, phenomenon that you watch just to make yourself feel better after a day of school or work or whatever, that you won't address a film which is a bit more complicated and eventually asks you to focus for two hours and to think about some things, to put them together. But this said, um empirically i think i have always a lot of very good spectators in us to be honest and this is because uh us is such a big country with a lot of intellectuals a lot of universities a lot of film criticism which is important for example i come from a country where uh, you know the, the only film criticism is a little bit of you know some blogs on the internet so they do not really influence too much uh, what people are watching. I had a lot of good press in US. And then there's something else. Um, of course, I like a lot when my films are released in theaters. That's the ultimate goal of every filmmaker. But at the same time, there is a world of festivals. We have to acknowledge that a way of releasing for, the fi for these films are festivals. And in the festivals, I don't know, my films will cruise. 50 to 100 festivals, so there is going to be some audience there. What matters more for me is um, the quality of the conversations that I'm having with the audience by the end of the film. Whenever this is good, and whenever people have understood at least some of what I wanted to have in the film, it's already okay. And if people were not bored, have not left the audience, have not left the theater, and they have understood pretty much like 
80% of the film, it's already very good. I will tell you a little bit of a joke from Khan. Of course, everybody has some questions about this film, about the ending. And of course, the ending is not very clear for very many people because, not because it's not clear, because it's interpretable. And I was talking to somebody from uh, US who liked a lot my film in Cannes and I said, don't worry, the film is going to be well received there. There's just one catch. People won't, won't understand precisely the ending. So during the promotion, you need to make sure and tell them that, look, if you didn't get the ending, it's all right. That's okay. So that they don't feel uh, uncomfortable because they are so much used that everything is clear in a film that they have some problems whenever things are not crystal clear, black and white, as you say. And for me, they are not. And they are not uh, intentionally because life is not like this. Nothing is clear. And I'm not trying to make a film simplifying life, but quoting life. So about the bears. <laughs> yes, it's okay. I'm used. I I I know. I need to talk. <laughs> so let's put yeah. it this way. Uh, maybe without giving away too much. Uh, in your movie, you investigate uh, the dark corners of contemporary life, and uh, also for me, that uh, some something uh, some things are in a very clear way, and some it more enigmatical. Let's let's say mysterious. Uh, maybe could you tell us more about the about the ending, but maybe about the bear costumes uh, used during the feasts, uh, and uh, are they connected to our maybe violent or, or competitive essence, and uh, also maybe to connect uh, to the end, but by your own reason without putting too much. Um, first of all, the bears that you see in the film in that feast, they exist. Of course, I haven't invented them, uh, and now we can. Each of us have a different explanation about why they have this habit. My explanation and the use in the film is that, you know, because I made the film about this inner conflict between the animal in us and our more human uh, part of us, I thought that this is a very good way of uh, finding a visual uh, a kind of element for the theme that I wanted to bring in the film. Because they use these, these bear costumes, as they say in the film, to be one with the animal and to tame the animal. Of course, at the beginning, they were trying to tame the, the outside animal, the bear that they, are, they were scared about. For me, in the film, what's important is that the film tries to speak about this... Um, need that we have to tame the animal inside us. That's the animal that we need to tame. And if you want, this is how I'm getting closer to the ending. At the end, the film is made in such a way in which it's never absolutely clear what this guy sees in the forest. And the what I liked a lot in, in all these screenings that I made accompanying the film is that people had a lot of explanations because I'm trying not to give them an explanation myself and not because I want to keep things for myself or whatever, but, you know, uh, film expresses itself in a certain way with a certain degree of abstractness, if you want. And if you try to translate everything into words, you will oversimplify some things. So some people there were convinced that these are just bears from the forest. For some other people, these are people dressed in bears. For some other people, uh, they are creatures of the dark coming from this uh, subconscious that the forest represents, and this is also a very good interpretation. For me, what matters at the end is that I speak about a character who is in between these two worlds. That's the part that I can speak about in this, in this kind of conversations. We have a character at the end who tries to figure out things and all of a sudden he is in between these two worlds, a, a, a warmer world, a world of music, of affection, of love, of community, of the woman, of the woman he loves. And this is on one side and on the other side there are The, there is the darkness, there are the instincts, there are all these animalic <clears throat> impulses and this forest, this darkness calling him to his basic instincts. 
Uh, I was asked, what is he going to do? I don't know. Question is, what are we going to do? Because this is a fight that we are always, all of us having in us in different degrees. And sometimes we choose better, sometimes not. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, we speak now after this uh, war in Ukraine has started. And this war shows you something that's awful, that uh, in a flip of a coin from today until tomorrow, there is such an unbelievably uh, dark side in each of us. And we can be cruel to such an extent and do not share any kind of feelings and empathy towards somebody else as long as somebody delivers us a story and makes us believe that this other person belongs to a different tribe. And that, that's, that's kind of sad to, 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 to understand this about the way we are. And uh, I think that somehow the film also speaks about this need of introspection and this need of making sure that we know what our beliefs are about the others, about the world, about tolerance. Because now, um, you know, I have this feeling that because of this uh, political correctness, there is a very dual um, kind of truth existing in our minds at the same time. One which is what we really believe and the other one which is what we say because we know that this is correct to say. Anybody from the audience? Maybe? Okay, so let's leave the bears for the uh, for the imagination of the spectators. Spectators, uh, I would like to ask you something that is more connected to your method and maybe to the pain you were asked already about. Uh, uh, I'm interested in maybe the most complicated shot in the movie that is the very long shot of the town meeting. Uh, uh, how how was it made? What is what what was most difficult in making this shot? Uh, was there any space for like improvisation by the actors, or was it written uh, in advance? Um, first of all, there's something to say about this. Um, it it was complicated to make, very very complicated. It's true, but it's important if the shot um, fulfills its purpose. Because finally, you do not make films to show how strong you are and what you can do. I made that shot so long because it is part of the logic of the whole film. If the whole film presents everything in just one, uh, one single uh, long shot per scene, I couldn't have broken this grammar for that shot. Therefore, I was making an effort of trying to understand how can you shoot a reunion with so many people talking and with some main characters that I didn't want to forget about and with people facing each other in just one shot. So it wasn't like if you want a performance in itself because, you know, we are, we are not competitors. This is not uh, athletism. We are filmmakers. And I'm very happy whenever people do not notice necessarily how this shot is made they are supposed to be captured by the energy of the shot. This is what I was looking for, the energy, the atmosphere. And then, yes, I wanted that the shot uh, preserves the same style as the whole film. Um, it, uh, I had just two days to shoot this thing and it didn't go well at all the first day. It was a complete flop. I had a previous day just to rehearse, but as you know, in filmmaking rehearsals, you know, you can rehearse a million times. It's nothing like shooting. And I think that um, the first complicated thing for me there was to understand uh, how can I place the people that I can see everybody from the same shot, which is complicated. The second complicated thing was to understand where is the focus in the shot, because of course, film is a very technical thing. You have a focus puller, he needs to know he is on shelf and who is not. Uh, the next complicated thing was to understand how I can keep the, the focus, the attention on the main characters, even if a lot of other people are talking. Um, and then um, the, in the screenplay, I had uh, 26 pages written and the, the shot is only 17 minutes. 
And this, this is because I decided while I was staging the situation, not that it's too long, but there's something, a convention in the film that I challenged here. In the film, the convention is that people talk one after the other. You talk, then I talk. And in between, we listen. But of course, that situation was not at all like this. People were talking on top of one another. So what I did, I decided that I took some of the pages from the screenplay and I overlapped them with the other pages. So I allowed people to speak at the same time. Of course, for the sound people, this is a nightmare. And for the mixing people, this is a nightmare as well. But it started giving a little bit the feeling that the situation is not staged and there's a chaos which was organized, but people do talk at the same time, a lot of things. And, you know, the best um, spectators for this scene are um, the uh, Hungarians living in Romania who also understand Romanian. Yet they are the only ones who can understand, like in a polyphonic kind of mixing, what whatever everybody says. Because... Um, whenever I translate, I can only translate the main lines. All the others I cannot translate, but there's a choir behind. People speak about a lot of things. And the ultimate uh, decision which really helped us uh, finally get this plan, um, I involved for once the extras in a different way. You know, the extras are these people, especially um, at the countryside, when you shoot there, they are I don't know, some peasants, and they come over there for a little bit of a payment and a sandwich. And always the day is very long for them. It's very cold. They get bored. And you are supposed to make a film, and you want to have reactions and faces. And you talk to people who do not understand precisely why, what you want and why, it, why you make this 20 times. Uh, but working with us two days, little by little, and they saw how, how involved I was and the actors, Little by little, they got to have a little bit of the conscious that the scene needs to get somewhere. So by the end of the second day, I, I changed something profoundly that you tell the extras. Normally you tell the extras, shut up, shut up, don't talk, let the actors talk. You just pretend that you talk and then we will add some extra sounds. So shut up. And I decided in the last uh, part of the second day to let them talk. And I said, look, you know what? Uh, you are... Uh, as important a character here in this reunion as all the other actors. You are the collective character. You need to express what you feel, each of you, so react the way you would react normally. Of course, I created a big chaos and we couldn't uh, record the sound for a while, but little by little, this gave them the right energy and the right attitude, and it motivated in a certain way the actors. All of a sudden, the actors needed to shout and to find the right moment to, to, to say what they needed to say because the crowd was not polite with them any longer. And this is how we got, I think we, we only shot some 23 takes because they were, they were very long. The take was, I don't know, 20 minutes. And then I needed some 45 minutes to watch again the take, to make notes about all the things which are, were wrong and to go and talk to each other actor and correct each other thing. So, I think I answered the second part of it. Uh, you cannot improvise when you're shooting plan seconds, just one, one long take. There's no improvisation. And not in this scene. Um, there's a freedom that the actors get to express what they feel after you rehearse a lot of times. And then there's a truth coming. But improvising, it's not really possible because there are a lot of signs people need to know when they start. And... Also, there's something technical, you know, for a scene like this, for a 17-minute scene, if you cannot edit, you need to have it, like, I don't know, close to perfect. And close to perfect, as you know, that does not exist in cinema. They are people. So at least I need to edit the sound. If the actors are always going to tell the same lines, I can edit lines of what they said from different takes and compose, I don't know, one take that I will use. But all in all, it was really very complicated to get to the end. And none of the shots, none of the takes were, were perfect. But uh, the energy in the last two were, was good enough that I could have it in the film. Thank you. These are the last questions from the audience. Anybody has? If no, maybe a special question, maybe personal. 
uh, I think one of the most visible or the biggest uh, books behind you in your impressive library is uh, about Yul Yulmaz Gine, the I believe Kurdish director, famous, who also won in the 80s his, his, his prize in Cannes. This is one of your favorites, or maybe could you tell us more about your beloved directors or inspirations that you don't uh, talk quite often? It's it's not a book, it's a DVD oh, book. Of movies, okay. Yeah, it's a DVD box. Uh, I have several. I have the Italian neo realism. It's the Pomodoro, okay? Yeah, it's it's easier to uh, look. Um, um, there are two two kinds of directors, you know, and we are all influenced by uh, Cinema Paradiso and this idea that a filmmaker has grown up uh, watching films uh, in a theater when he was a, a child, but it wasn't it wasn't my case. Uh, I was watching a lot of cinema when I was young, but uh, not not systematically in the sense that I was a spectator and I, um, I grew up uh, in Yash, which is uh, quite, a, quite a big town, but not a town with a cinema tech. It was not the capital. So um, it wasn't that any of my film exposure was, uh, I don't know, systematical in any kind. Uh, so the films that influenced me at the beginning of my career were rather popular films or the films from Eastern Europe that we could watch during that period in the 70s or 80s or older films. There was a, a kind of cinematheque that was uh, traveling. So this is how I discovered uh, The Bicycle Thieves, for example, which I quote from time to time as one of the films that influenced me. Um on the Romanian television in the 80s, we could watch uh, Keslovsky's Decalogue, which was very different from the kind of films that uh, Romania was doing. But uh, also the Romanian films were uh, influenced, but in a very twisted way. The censorship acted in a certain way in Romania and I don't know uh, how people got to be directors during that period, but... Um, the, the films that we did, we produced in the 70s and 80s, were nothing but truthful. They didn't have anything to do with reality. And we often used to say that, I don't know, uh, in these films, there were people that looked a little bit like us and speak a little bit like us, but at the same time, they were like aliens. Nothing like that ever happened in reality, psychologically speaking. So somehow I think that I developed and pretty much most of the directors of my age developed this, I don't know, this uh, belief that if ever we are to make a film, it's going, we're going to make it way better and more truthful and closer to reality than all the films in theaters that we were watching. And I think it's not an accident that we were all driven by realism because uh, it was, if you want a reaction, against a, set, a certain kind of a very metaphorical way of filmmaking, which was probably justified, let's say, in the 80s because of the censorship uh, and because people, uh, directors were trying not so much to tell a story, but to insert in the film some quotes against the regime and stuff like this, some comments. But this didn't have any more relevance after the fall of communism. So all of a sudden, after the fall of communism, we had a very, very bad period of 10 years in which our cinema didn't go anywhere. And I think that we reacted somehow to, to that period. And uh, this led to, I don't know what some people call this Romanian new wave, which was kind of inspired by all the realistic movements in the history of, of cinema. But I want to get... a uh, back to the bears for a second. I don't want to, to, to let the audience leave without having, having an answer. I can't have a more precise answer and interpretation that I did. It's just that um, if you think about the meaning of the forest, and if you think about, um, I don't know, um, the subconscious where from, from where all the fears come, I think that it's going to be easier for you to interpret the ending of this man being in between two worlds with a lot of, I don't know, uh, impulses and instincts and creatures that haunt him and call for him. And it's about the struggle that he needs to um, 
handle about uh, himself, about his decisions, about his future, and about his children, and about what are the rights, the right things to tell to your children in a world that we live today. Anybody from the audience, finally? If not, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this was Christian Munjo, the director with the most complex answers for our question. Thank you for your time and for your movies. Close. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. You and uh, hope you will enjoy the next uh, mental hygiene in, in September. There will be new movies, new extra movies by Gudmund Argumundsson, a new Ulrich Seidel, also a new Olivia Wilde. So, hope to enjoy it and see you in September. Thank you very much.